Good afternoon again, everyone. If I could ask everyone who is standing to find their seats, please, before we get started. That being said, I'm extremely excited to get this show on the road. Um, so let me just acknowledge all present by saying all protocols observed. All right, let's get that out of the way. For those of you who don't know me, but I hope most of you do, I am Joanna Banks, the Chief Executive Officer of Panjam Investment Limited. I love my job, but the easiest part of my job is to get to, to, get to do this, um, which is the crowd warm up, spelling the Wi-Fi password, and asking people to very nicely but loudly to, um, if you're entering, please have a seat quickly. The best part about being CEO of Panjam is that I'm able to participate in its legacy of nation building. Um, and to be quite honest with you, it was a big reason why I even applied to work at Panjam. How long ago was that, Stephen? Fe feels like a lifetime, all right, okay. Um, I would say about six years ago. Um, Panjam's legacy is extremely strong, not just in Jamaica, um, but specifically in downtown Kingston. I won't steal Stephen Stonder, he's going to speak a, a lot about that in a few minutes. Um, but I am incredibly proud to be standing here today as a representative of Panjam. Um, in that regard, I'm very proud to welcome you to the second staging of the Mars Space Lecture Series, where we will discuss the business of cities partnering for urban revitalization. We would like to make this event interactive, so it's on to some admin at the moment. So if you could pull your phones out, if you're actually going to participate with us today, you plan on asking us questions, I'm going to show you how you can participate with us. Um, our friends at the Caribbean Policy Research Institute, some of you may know it as Capri, have enabled us to use an online audience interaction tool for the submission of questions that I'll ask our keynote speaker, Professor Greg Clark, um, later in the program. In order to use this, you're gonna to have to have two things, access to the internet and access to the application. So let's get you on the internet first. Um, assuming that you want to connect to Wi-Fi in here, um, the username and password for the Wi-Fi, or I guess how to access the Wi-Fi is on the right-hand side of, of, of the screen, of the screen behind me. My brother actually just very nicely shared the password to my iPad, so I know it works. Um, so you, cho you choose the Wi-Fi name JCC Guest, and you enter the password, all common letters, JCC Guest underscore 20. All right? Give you a, a minute. I know I spelt it, but it's on the right-hand side of the slide. Up there. All right. Um, once you have that set, you are to open your web browser whatever you choose to use. Um, and you're going to enter, it does not matter if you put www dot, you can or you don't have to, but it's sli dot do. sli dot do. Once you get there, it's gonna ask you for an event code. And it's very easy. It's MF Lecture 2022, which is also up on the screen behind me, but this time on the left. Um, and when you enter that, you're just going to click the, I think there's a blue arrow right beside where it says event code. When you get there, you'll be able to type in your questions. The most fun part, of course, is that you get to vote on other people's questions. I encourage you to both enter your questions and vote on questions that you like so that when I'm back up here, I'll be able to ask Greg his questions, um, the most popular questions that, that we see from the crowd. So to be clear, it says it's optional for you to enter your name. You don't have to do so. You can do so anonymously. Um, we'll have about 30 minutes for Q&A, 
after Greg is finished speaking. So I encourage you to enter your questions as soon as you think about them. You don't have to wait until Greg is finished speaking. You can do, you can enter the question whenever you feel like it. Um, but of course, every, once you enter, as everybody who is in Slido will also be able to see questions and vote. Uh, with that admin out of the way, I'd now like to welcome to the podium Panjam's executive chairman and my best friend, Mr. Stephen Facey. Good afternoon, everyone. Isn't it wonderful to get together in person, not be at home, sitting in front of a screen, talking to yourself? Really welcome, everyone. It's, it's a real pleasure and a, and to, to, to be here again. Uh, on this occasion. I do want to recognize someone sitting in the front, my mother, Valerie Facey. <laughs> Welcome, mother. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this second staging of the Morris Facey Lecture Series. After a two-year hiatus, we are pleased to be able to reconvene and host what we know will be an insightful discussion. One concerning the framework required for the robust redevelopment of Jamaica's urban landscape. It will deal detail proven strategies for our city's sustainable development and redevelopment. It will educate, but more importantly, our hope is that it will foster effective collaboration and action towards a single united agenda embraced by all stakeholders of downtown Kingston for a project of reinvention, innovation, restoration, and revitalization. Sound urban development can transform the social and economic fabric of a society. It will allow us to accelerate our progress and remain viable in a continuously evolving world. By getting urban development right, cities can contribute to the uni unification of a people, offer better livelihoods, promote social inclusion, and increase prosperity. Its successful execution speaks directly to nation building and the creation of a national identity that we can all be proud of. Another way of thinking about it is to ask the question, what happens when we do not have an effective and sustainable urban development program? As we drive around our country today, read or listen to the news on a daily basis, we perhaps are confronted with the answer. The purpose of this event is to continue a critical conversation about the revitalization of our cities and urban centers. Your choice to be present here in this room indicates that you see value in their renewal and want to be part of a movement that will propel our capital and our country into becoming a resilient and modern society. The Honorable Morris Facey, my late father, was a trailblazer in this regard. As founder of Panjam, he made pioneering contributions to the development of our nation for the benefit of all. So dedicated was he to nation building that it led him to form various planning organizations, including the Kingston Restoration Company and the Tourism Action Plan, which today is the Tourism Product Development Company. He adopted Jamaica's positive development as his cause, and it guided his business goals and decisions during his extensive professional career. My father's drive came from a deep love for his country and his belief that Jamaica could be the ideal place to live, work, do business, and prosper. He also supported sustainable development in areas that included education, the environment, and the arts. To him, this is what it meant to fulfill his duty as a responsible citizen. Many of you 
may not know of the long association of the Facey family with downtown Kingston. For the lawyers in the room, particularly the contract lawyers, you may be familiar with the seminal uh, contract law case, Harvey v. Facey of 1893. The Facey, in that instance, was my great-grandfather, Larkin Mandeville Facey. His son, my grandfather, C.B. Facey, grew up at Bumper Hall Pen, the subject of that case. Bumper Hall Pen is part of what is today May Pen Cemetery in Southwest St. Andrew. He witnessed firsthand the devastation of the 1907 earthquake, the fire that followed, and the rebuilding of the city thereafter. He started and built a successful trading business right here on Harbor Street, what was then called CB Facey Limited, which, when sold in the late 1950s, provided the capital for the creation of Jamaica Property Company and ultimately the investment in what, has to, what was to become Panjam in 1964. My father met his wife, my mother, on the docks right here in downtown Kingston in 1952. When he went to collect his father, returning from England on one of the many banana boats that carried passengers in those days, Valerie was traveling with her family on the same ship on their way to America. She never made it. <laughs> My father and his brother Lloyd worked in the business on Harbor Street, and that is perhaps where his love affair with and passion for the city began. My family knew downtown Kingston back when it was the heart of Jamaica's commercial district, when it was a vibrant and thriving city. It was the muse that drove my father to create his first major buildings here, the North American Life Building, now the Air Jamaica Building, and, the, and Scotia Center. Many of the successful people and companies you know today took root in downtown Kingston. They access networks of goods, services, and contacts right here. And there is no reason why we cannot recreate this story for generations to come. It was certainly the foundation of my family's success. Panjam has recently underscored its continued commitment to downtown Kingston, with the long-awaited opening of our very own landmark development, the Rock Hotel and Residences. I hope you've all been there. Right next door on the Kingston waterfront. Still a leader in innovation, we ensured that the property was made for business and entertainment with sustainability in mind. This evening, through the Mars Facey Lecture Series, we continue to exercise Panjam's commitment to honoring his legacy, and we pledge to continue his work by urging the proactive and long-term planning of our municipalities, whilst also facilitating collaboration for its execution. The dynamism of cities represents a major sustainable development opportunity, but is Jamaica ready for it? And who will lead us through this urgent fundamental change. If we do not radically adapt our approach, what will the future look like? If the present is any predictor of the future, we know the answer. Luckily for us, we can look to the urban cities around the globe that have progressed further in this process for direction. We can also consult experts who have imparted their valuable, invaluable knowledge in contribution to the sustained development of resilient cities. At our inaugural staging in 2019, under the theme, The Cost of Chaos, envisaging a resilient metropolis, our previous speaker, Dr. Petra Ortiz, discussed metropolitan planning and gave insights into overcoming the challenges of urban development. This year, we have another expert here with us this evening. 
He is Professor Greg Clark. Welcome, Greg. And he is a world-renowned authority on cities, urban innovation, investment, and the net zero transition. For a period spanning over 35 years, he has worked with more than 300 cities, 40 national governments, 20 multilateral institutions, and multiple global corporates and investors. He has been a senior advisor on urban investment to the World Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank, and the European Investment Bank. He has chaired more than 20 internal advisory boards for individual cities that are reformulating their future investment strategies and long-term plans. Since 2020, he has been tracking the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic in 100 cities globally and has developed a unique framework for anticipating the post-pandemic city. Greg will speak to us about the business of cities, a term he coined that speaks to the role that enterprises play in the future of cities, with partnerships being vital for successful urban renewal. In his presentation, he will cover the role of private investment in urban restoration and regeneration, and discuss platforms for place leadership where businesses can take a credible lead. The private sector is a key stakeholder that must bear fundamental responsibility for accelerating our city's development. Its members must become genuine partners of the public sector in order to be engines of economic growth and drivers of change. Cooperation between the public and private sector is critical as the duty of working towards sustainable development is shared by the government, businesses, and civil society. The truth is we need private and public sector activism to overcome our decades-long inertia. We are indeed seeking an urban development movement with participation from all stakeholders because no matter which sector you are part of, we all want a brighter future for our city. Will you join us on this journey to envisage and create and protect the urban centers that we deserve? We must work to get this right as Jamaica's capital is a destination to be experienced and we have much to offer the world. But to get there, we must have a collective vision of our city and recognize the role each play in forming that vision while collaborating to achieve it. Again, as the Honorable Morris Facey believed, it is our responsibility as citizens. We have all the ingredients. We just need to bring them together. And Professor Clark has volunteered to help us do so. As such, please join me in welcoming him to the podium. Greg? Good afternoon to all of you. It's great to be here with you. And uh, it's one of the dreams of my life, actually, to be in Kingston for a few days, meeting local leaders to talk about the future of the city. I want to say a special thank you to the Pan Jam Corporation, to Joe Banks and her team, to the CB Facey Foundation, Anna Ward, who's done so much to bring me here, and to the Facey family to say thank you to you uh, for the invitation to be here to share these thoughts. I'd also like to thank Michael McMorris from the Jamaican Chamber of Commerce, who shared lots of insights with me as we've been preparing for this. Now, what I want to do in the presentation today is really in two halves, and Stephen's introduction is perfect for what I need to say. I hope that you can see here on the picture Morris Facey, and you know that he was a business leader, a family man, but also an inspired civic leader, somebody who had a vision not just of his business, but of Kingston, of Jamaica, and of the future of the people of this country as well. So I thought I'd start with a little quiz, which is always a sort of British thing to do. You can see six other people here with Maurice Facey, and at the end, I'm going to ask you who they are. Now, don't Google them, because that will be too easy for you. But who is Maurice Facey with in this picture? 
I'm sure many of you recognize the gentleman in the middle of the bottom row, right? Okay, so Michael Bloomberg we know, but who are the others? We'll, we'll find out as we go along. This will be a journey into them. And as Stephen has already said, Dr. Pedro Ortiz was honored to give the first Morris Facey lecture, and I communicated with Pedro last week. He sends everybody his best wishes. He's a man that I esteem and respect greatly. And everything that Pedro said about metropolitan planning, metropolitan infrastructure, the need to resolve um, the chaos in order to avoid the cost of chaos, I totally subscribe to that. And uh, I've spent many times engaging with Pedro over the last 20 years, and I think that his lecture was superb. And if you haven't seen it, it is, of course, available on YouTube as the Morris Facey lecture, Pedro Ortiz, The Cost of Chaos, very, very much worth a read. Now, what I want to do today is to take some of the things that Pedro said and to really focus on some complementary messaging, particularly about the role of business. And as Stephen said, it's very clear that uh, my message is going to be that if we want cities to succeed in the century of cities, then business has to be a proactive and responsible partner in that process. So my lecture is going to be in two halves. I'll begin by talking about the century of cities and everything that means. And what I'm trying to explain, I think, is that we're at a special moment in human history where a new kind of opportunity arises and therefore a new kind of leadership becomes essential. And then in the second half of the lecture, I'll talk about the business of cities, the role of business in securing the promise of the century of the city. So here goes. I think it's very important to begin any conversation about cities with people. And the key thing for us to understand is this rather obvious chart right in the center here that shows you how over this century of cities that in my mind begins in 1980 and ends in 2080, we move from 43% of the world's population at that time in 1980, 2.3 billion people, to 81% of the world's population in 2080, then 9.3 billion people living in cities. So the human race, from an anthropological perspective, is suddenly urbanizing, suddenly in the sense of human history. Over this century in which we are all living, this urbanization process is accelerating rapidly. In 1980, something unusual occurred. For the first time in recent history, the countries of the global north began a process of reurbanization because of technology and globalization and the growth of services, just at the same time as the countries in the global south accelerated a process of urbanization that they were already in, learning from the great experience of the Asian tiger economies. So both hemispheres of the world were suddenly in lockstep, synchronized in a pro-urban trend that the world hadn't seen for the 300 or 400 years that preceded. And so this creates this big acceleration in the way that cities work and evolve. And I don't know if you can read the slides very well because some of these uh, texts are small. We will make all of the slides available to you, so don't feel you need to. But the point is that in 1980, there were about 275 cities of 1 million people or more in the world. By 2080, 100 years later, it will be 1,600 cities of 1 million people or more. And you can see in the right-hand side of my chart which parts of the world are the most rapidly urbanizing parts in each decade of the century of the city. And if you look closely, you'll notice that my prediction is that it will be cities in the Arctic regions that will accelerate fastest in the final decade of this. Now, this century of the city leads to a very obvious and big choice. That's not a choice about whether we have urbanization or not. It's a choice about the quality of the urbanization that we get. 
Do we want to have good urbanization where our investment in our infrastructure, our planning, our amenities, our facilities, our housing, our real estate, our investment in those things keeps up with the pace of our population growth and the nature of our economic change. In other words, we build the carrying capacity of the cities as the populations grow and the economy diversifies. Or do we want to have bad urbanization? where the population grows, the economy changes, but we fail to synchronize investment in our infrastructure, our utilities, our real estate, and our systems. And the population growth exceeds the carrying capacity of the city with all of the consequences this brings of pollution and congestion and inequality and ill health and indeed segregation and separation. So I put it to you that the big choice in this century of the city is the choice between good urbanization and bad urbanization. And it's the quality of our urbanization. And as Stephen said to me yesterday, it's the quality of life, not the quantity of life that matters. Well, it's the quality of our urbanization, not the quantity of it that we should be concerned about. Now, why does all of this matter? It matters because in cities, some things can occur that it's very difficult to foresee or imagine occurring elsewhere. So I think of this as the magic of cities, if you want to put it that way. So one part of the magic of cities is that cities concentrate people together. And the consequences of concentration is proximity. And the effect of proximity is interaction and density and other things. And all of this leads to network effects, things that accelerate the exchange of ideas. They rapidly increase the productivity of workers, of capital, and of firms. These network effects rapidly exchange ideas in a, in a creative fusion. But they only work if we have invested in shared spaces and places in which the people can come together. Another magical property of cities is something we call agglomeration or the productivity advantages where trade and enterprise both between people and between firms lead to specialization. Each does what she or he is best at and that specialization increases the value that they're able to create. But all of this productivity and agglomeration advantage of cities only works if we've invested in the infrastructure required to support it and facilitate it. And so it goes on. Cities provide multiplication and magnification advantages. They produce a critical mass of people, of assets, of capital that are able to sustain what we call scale effects. That's why we get the best hospitals, the best universities, scientific breakthroughs, and everything else. But all of that depends upon collaboration between the parties that are in the city. It doesn't happen just because of the numbers. It happens because of the quality of the interaction that they have. And we can say the same thing about our populations. The openness that occurs in cities, particularly cities that have a history of trade, produces a diverse population that creates a different kind of identity that can come together to form a kind of creative advantage, the creative advantage of diversity. But this is only possible if people are able to meet each other as equals within a city and they're able to participate in processes of interaction and exchange that enable them to be peers, to have a parity of esteem with one another. So we have to tackle segregation if we want to unlock the magic of the creative advantage of the city. And the same thing occurs with social mobility and social opportunity. You know, our cities can be efficient places. They're great places for sharing. The mobility systems enable people to have opportunities they wouldn't otherwise have. But all of that only really works if our educational system provides people with similar kinds of opportunities. Otherwise, our cities can become places of segregation. 
So I'm explaining to you that cities have a kind of unusual magic to them that occurs because of this proximity and this concentration. But that magic only realizes itself with the good urbanization scenario. It doesn't happen with the bad urbanization scenario. Now, urbanization itself is not quite the same thing as density. This is a density map of the world. But density, just like urbanization, can be good density or bad density, depending upon how it's organized, facilitated, and invested in. And what this explains to us, I think, is that as this century of the city evolves, our ability to get the right kind of density in the right kind of places is very important. And as I'm going to say later on, getting the right kind of density in a downtown is a very important element of unlocking, as it were, the promise of the downtown. Another feature of this century of the cities is that our cities are becoming increasingly networked, not just networked internally. The network effects of the cities don't just happen within cities, they happen also between cities. It's rather obvious, I think, in Jamaica that Kingston and Montego Bay have a certain important relationship in just the way that Pedro explained in the first Morris Facey lecture the relationship between downtown Kingston and the wider metropolitan area. But it's also becoming clear that networks of cities on a transnational basis, the cities of the Caribbean, the cities of Central America, the cities of Northern Europe, the cities of, uh, of the southern cone of Latin America, they are becoming increasingly interacting with each other using those same ideas about collaboration, trade, specialization, and productivity advantages to chart particular kinds of courses. So a big question emerges for Kingston about what kinds of networks it wants to be in and how does it want to use those networks to become the specialized city that it's capable of. Another idea I talk about a lot is the DNA of cities. This is the idea that, of course, whilst it's easy for us to compare all cities with each other and to produce benchmarks and rankings and ratings analysis of which city is doing better than which, in fact, every city is totally unique. A unique history, a unique society, a unique geography, a unique place in the world. And cities can either play to their strengths, and we think of their strengths as being a kind of genetic code of 12 elements in three different categories of endowed, uh, inherited, and acquired traits that each city has. They can either play to their unique advantages, or they can pursue a policy, if you like, of copying other places that leads to a kind of a, a homogenized city where you almost don't know which city you're in. So it's very clear that the authentic city the credible city is a city that plays to its own advantages in these times. Now, I'm characterizing for you some of the big issues that come with this century of the city that is the backdrop to thinking about the business of cities. And of course, technology is a very important part of all of that. In this century of the city, the rapid acceleration of enabling technologies is producing completely new paradigms in terms of how we create businesses and jobs and enterprises. The future of trade is locked in to these technology advantages. And we talk now about being in Industry 4.0 or the new, the fourth industrial revolution, a digital revolution. And as I'll say later on, this digital revolution is not just a revolution in the economy, it's also a revolution in the way we think about and manage cities. But just for the moment, let's talk about the implication that this has on the jobs that are available within our cities. One of the consequences of these new platform technologies, we've seen them before. So we saw in the 1980s that previously separated activities of banking and accountancy and insurance and pensions and stock markets, all of those things that we now think of as financial services, these were previously separated activities that came together 
because of the growth of trading platforms that were able to allocate capital very quickly between otherwise separate activities and asset classes. And now we talk about financial services as if this idea has been around for 100 years. It hasn't. It's been around for about 40 years. And later in the 1990s, new design technologies made it possible for film and TV and music and fashion and art and indeed cuisine. But every industry that has a design component at its heart suddenly was enabled by the new design technologies and started to integrate. And the phenomena of the creative or cultural industries began to emerge and they became big drivers of job creation within our cities. So technology has the effect of what we call disintermediating old industries and forcing together industries into new forms of creativity. If you like, this is the creative destruction that Schumpeter spoke about in such a detailed way. Well, my proposition to you is that we're living in a time now when the new platform technologies that have emerged in digitization, in the convergence technologies within our, our, our environment, uh, and in particular, the technologies that have emerged around the body, life sciences, biomedicine, and everything else, are the technologies that are driving new economies in our city and are the future of new kinds of jobs. So whether it's the innovation economy, whether it's the trading of new kinds of urban services, the integration of infrastructure with planning, with real estate, with architecture, with logistics, with design, or whether it's the emergence of the experience economy, the thing that has sort of integrated the visitor economy with retail and education and health, the place-based experience-led economy, and the circular economy, these four areas are the big areas for job creation in our cities, driven by technology. And the ability of our cities, in a sense, to reinvent themselves for these new forms of jobs into the future are going to be very important. Now, if we started to talk, for example, about the future of the waterfront in Kingston, then thinking about how the waterfront creates a stage for a new kind of experience economy is a different way of thinking about it than asking where do we put the retail, where do we put the tourism, where do we put the entertainment, etc. So we have to think about the experience more than anything else. I'm continuing with the century of the city and reminding you of something you know only too well that the climate crisis, the heating of the world, the rising of the sea levels, is a physical threat to our cities. This map shows you the 500 cities that are vulnerable to a half meter rise in sea levels that would occur if we exceeded the 1.5 to 2 degrees of global warming originally agreed at COP21 in Paris as being the maximum that we were prepared to tolerate. As you know, there is a huge risk that we will rapidly exceed that target over the next period of time. So 500 vulnerable cities uh, are visible, uh, and there are many more to come at higher degrees of global warming associated with sea level rises. So cities have an interesting and unique relationship with climate change. On the one hand, cities concentrate activities that emit carbon, and therefore they are a key part of the problem. On the other hand, they are the very obvious victims of climate change. They are the places where climate change is going to wreak havoc most quickly. But they're also, thirdly, the places of innovation, where change and reinvention can occur in the way people uh, uh, travel, in the way they work, in the way they consume, what they do with their waste. And if you like, cities then have within them the potential to be the pioneers in the fight against climate change if the leadership is there in the right ways. And there are all sorts of examples of how this can work. We know that the decarbonized city will be clean it will be connected and it will be compact. It will clean its utilities and its infrastructure. It will be well connected by low carbon forms of transport as well as being digitally well connected. And we know it will be compact. It will be frugal with land uses. It will prioritize good density in order to reduce the individual footprint of buildings and the people who operate within them. And we can talk much more about this later. 
Now, coming to the most recent part of this century of the cities, let's talk briefly about the COVID pandemic. The key point I want to make is that this pandemic was not just a health crisis and an economic shock, but it's also rather obviously an agent of change. It has been an agent of change in the sense that the requirement to lock down our, our, our nations and our countries for periods in order to protect people from infection had the unanticipated consequence of changing a whole series of behaviors about how people uh, work, how they travel, how they consume and other things. But it also revealed to national governments and to large corporates some of the risks associated with the kind of peak globalization we were in just as the pandemic began. So I think it makes sense to talk about the pandemic having three phases to it. The pandemic phase, a kind of recovery phase, and then a reset or reinvention phase that I think is now beginning. Um, and, uh, and then there's, if you like, six elements of the pandemic that are really changing behavior. So I want to just talk very briefly about these. So trade and supply chains that were hyper-globalized proved to be non-resilient during the pandemic. And one of the consequences of that is a big agenda about reshoring, onshoring, or nearshoring production of certain kinds of goods for large markets. And this, interestingly, provides opportunities for some places while it provides challenges for others. And Perhaps Jamaica is one of the places that gets opportunities from this. You've seen this big rise, of course, in the use of technology, digital and services, as I've already said, not just how people consume and how they work, but also a big rise in the different ways in which people use technology for learning and for services. We've seen the health inequality agenda massively grow as revealed inequalities occurred during that pandemic management. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we've seen much closer link between planetary health and human health being observed, as well as big changes in the way that citizens and governments relate to each other. All of this, I think, points to us being in a moment when a kind of new social contract is being developed around the relationship between citizens, government, business, cities, and others. If you like, we're at a moment where we're re-establishing the rules of how we work together into the future. Now, for cities, this creates a kind of sorting and sifting effect. It's not that the city is dead, and I'll show you some data on that in a minute, but it is that cities now need to recognize this change in consumer behavior, in trade behavior, in uh, citizen priorities that have happened, and they have to refix themselves towards, uh, as it were, the change in what cities are now best at. I put this very simply by saying to people, cities have to shift out of thinking of themselves as being primarily an efficient location for corporates, for consumers and commuters, and shift in to thinking about the quality of what they offer in terms of habitat, innovation and experience, something I've already mentioned and we'll come back to very shortly. So the consequence of this, perhaps, is not so much to think that we're going to jump from the physical city to the virtual city, but rather that a new kind of blended city is emerging, where technology is being used to help us augment the city, to help us create places, to build communities of place, but using digital platforms to do it. And as we think about this, what we can observe is that this blended city is in a sense emerging all of the time. We're here together in a room having a face-to-face -face experience, but this lecture is being recorded and it will be shown later on a digital platform and people will participate in the discussion afterwards as well as during. So how we get the right omni-channel approach to our cities is going to be key for some time to come. So let's accelerate through a few more features of this. I think that our cities are changing their shapes. We're moving from singular cities with singular centers towards much more complex forms of urbanization, multiple city regions, combinations of cities and towns working together. In the second half of the century of the city, we'll talk much more about 
uh, uh, as it were, systems of places that work together, and much less about individual cities. We'll also think much more about how the global system of cities is changing. This is a picture I, I put together with colleagues from Jones Lang LaSalle and, and the team that we call the business of cities, identifying in 2020 how the hundred, as it were, most important cities in the world were beginning to to develop a typology of different kinds of interactions. So to put it very simply, in the center of this diagram, the established world cities, the New Yorks, the Singapores, the Tokyos, the Parises, around them, another group of competitors trying to compete with them for their share of the globally traded services and corporate headquarters and the media centers. But on the right-hand side, a completely different set of cities, a new set of gateway cities enabling interaction between rapidly emerging economies and the global flows of ideas and capital and trade and visitors. And on the left-hand side, a group of much smaller cities using the new technology platforms that I spoke about to specialize in the new industries that are emerging. So combining high quality of life with a specialization in new industries. And so the question for all of us is not how have we moved from having 10 world cities to having 100 world cities? But how long before we have 500 or 1,000? And as we think about Kingston's future, what role does Kingston want to play in this global circuit of ideas, of people, of innovations, of cultural products, of creative endeavors and everything else? And can it become some kind of regional hub in the Caribbean? And if so, what kind of hub uh, would that be? A really good question that I look forward to discussing with you. Now, I want to say a couple of bits about the pandemic itself. And uh, it's very difficult for you to see these slides. I appreciate that. But what I want to suggest to you is that I've been tracking about 20 different measures of how 100 cities are performing post-pandemic. And I'm just going to show you two. Uh, one of them that looks at um, uh, how... Um, public transport is being repatronized in our cities post-pandemic, and the other one that looks at what we call the return to the office. This one is about public transport, and what you can see is that essentially red dots are places where the public transport is below 75% return. Green dots is where we're up to you know, 100% or more than 100%. Can you spot, I don't know if you can, that actually the real laggard in this is North America? It's North American cities where the return to public transport has been the lowest. Actually, in Latin America, in much of Europe and the Middle East and stretching out into many parts of Asia, there's a big return to public transport going on and it's fueled, of course, by a different kind of investment in it. Now, we see the same pattern when we look at the return to the office. You can again see that in North America, the return to the office has been the most sluggish of all of the regions in the world, whereas in Latin America and the Caribbean, in Europe, the Middle East, and most of Asia, the return to the office is really accelerated. Now, what is it that explains these different patterns of the post-pandemic response? Well, I think in some cases, of course, it's the sector mix in the economy. If you've got more jobs that are easily digitized, more people will work remotely. That's rather obvious. If you have high levels of technology adoption, as North America has, you're much more likely to try to, uh, to, try to do jobs in a mobile way. But it's also something to do with population mobility and the willingness of people to move around and to change their lifestyles. But I think even more important than all of that is the level of urbanization within the different continents that sort of started before the pandemic. So in North America, Europe, Latin America, and Oceania, 81% of the population was already urbanized. But in India, it's only 37%. And it's 46% in Africa and in ASEAN. <coughs> 65% in the Middle East and in China. So in those countries that are less urbanized, there's much more of a return to the urbanization model that is in train uh, as part of this century of the cities. And this may be something we'll debate later on. Okay, so let's pull all of this together and say this leads to some very big debates. 
does technology reduce our need for cities or does it enhance our need for cities? Do the advantages of concentration in cities outweigh the disadvantages? Is good urbanization actually possible? Um, a great question, can a nation succeed without a success, successful capital city? Is urban governance failure always inevitable? It leads to these big questions that we want to debate. But I want to say to you that there are, I think, three new dimensions for the urban governance toolkit. And this is how we segue to the second half of the lecture. The three new aspects of urban governance that I think now emerging very strongly post-pandemic to partner with public governance, which includes the local government framework, the national government framework, um, all of the ways in which cities and urban policies are being developed, and the metropolitan governance that um, Pedro spoke about so convincingly in the first Morris Facey lecture. I think the three new areas of tool are firstly the enabling technologies that we've already discussed. The massive acceleration in technology over the last couple of years is giving us new ways to think about and manage our cities. The second one is the growth of private investment and private finance and corporate intentionality, what I sometimes call intentional capital, and its realization that the urbanization process means that value creation in the future is intimately connected with the urban realm. And then the third one is what I want to describe as the new art of place leadership, which I'll talk about quite a bit in a few moments. Now, the rest of this lecture is really going to be about the second of these two things as the new opportunity, I think, to create cities that are really, uh, uh, as it were, fit for the future and able to secure the advantages of good urbanization. But let's quickly say something about technology. And all I really want to say is that a suite of new enabling technology platforms, and they're in the middle of the top of this slide, so it's artificial intelligence, quantum computing, satellites, blockchain, high-capacity cabling, all of these enabling mechanisms, they're producing both much greater scientific discovery that you can see on the left-hand side, in everything from life sciences to biometrics to pharma to material sciences. And on the right-hand side, you can see that they're producing specific applications that are changing the way we lead our lives. Well, the consequences of all of that in the bottom left-hand corner is that technologies enable us to manage our cities differently. We can use technology to improve the efficiency of utilities, to reduce the waste of water, to measure our carbon footprint more effectively. We can use technologies to have single ticketing systems on transport. We can use our new technologies to create a different kind of security in our cities. Those technologies can be used to automate our logistics processes. So these technologies are having a sweeping effect on the management of our cities. And as I said before, on the bottom right-hand corner, these technologies are really inspiring a new kind of urban economy to emerge where new forms of job creation and value creation are occurring. Now, when we think about the intentional capital side of this, there are many examples. But if you just look globally at this one, this is the 100 or so financial institutions through the leadership of Mark Carney, the Canadian banker, that committed themselves to 140 trillion US dollars to support the global fight against climate change. They made this commitment in Glasgow at COP26 uh, uh, last year. 140 trillion US dollars being committed by them for the decarbonization process around the world. And I use this as, as the big macro example of, I think, a lot of processes that are going on below that in terms of how capital is available to re-equip our cities for the kind of change we're talking about. And the third tool I talked about was, as it were, the new art of place leadership. Much of what I'll say in the rest of this presentation is about how this new art is emerging and how if we recognize the complexity of places, we can see that place mismanagement, the mismanagement or the, the lack of leadership in places leads to all sorts of consequences which are unhelpful for all of the value creation that we want to do.
Whereas the new kind of combined place leadership that brings together local and national government with uh, people, community, NGOs, with utilities, institutions, and uh, infrastructures, and with business and investors, this combined form of place leadership where people give up sectoral priorities and instead focus on how to make the place uh, enable uh, other outcomes to occur is much more successful. So let's give you an example of this. Um, in much of public policy, places, I would suggest to you, are orphaned by government activities. There's a tendency of ministries in government to think about transport and housing and utilities, but never to see that these things are connected to each other in places. Or there's a tendency to think about education and health and art but never to put them together in a certain place. So it's an unusual feature of government practices all over the world, certainly not a story in any sense just about Jamaica, that places are orphaned by processes of public policy. And unless we adopt places actively, they remain orphans. So we all have to become adoptive parents of places, and we have to do it collaboratively with others to make that work. Now, city centers are a kind of special case in all of this. Why? Because city centers have the most diverse, the most intense, the most dynamic, and the most complex mix of activities that go on within them. Their places of work, their places to shop, their visitor destinations, their places of decision making, their infrastructure and utility hubs, their corporate headquarters, their media and information hubs, their art and cultural and historical uh, locations, and much, much more. So the stakeholder interests in the city center are so complex that these are the most intensive places on the planet. And the interactions between the stakeholders in the city centers really matter. So it requires a certain kind of clear vision, a special kind of leadership for a city center to really work. You can't leave the management of the city center to one stakeholder because it's impossible for them on their own to do everything that everybody needs. So you have to have some combined leadership. So city centers are a special case, but a very, very special case are capital city centers, where you combine not just all of the complexity I've just described about why city centers have to be managed actively and differently, but that is combined with the capital city being the nation's shop front to the world, being the gateway into the nation, being the source of national identity and pride and memory and monumentalism, and also being places where um, decisions are made that have huge impacts. So people like me who care about cities, we have a, a dinner party conversation that sometimes goes on, where the question is this, can you name a successful country that has a failing city centre? and a failing capital city. And if you'd like to play it now, you're welcome to shout out the names of any successful countries that you think have a failing capital city or a failing city center within that capital city. Would you like to do it? Brazil. Brazil. Very good one. Others? Australia. Is that in well, depends on your view about Canberra, I suppose. But... Uh, um, most people would say Canberra is a relatively successful city, at least now. It was boring for about 40 years, uh, but it's become more interesting. But I think Brazil is probably the key example. So whoever said Brazil, absolutely right. But that means that 196 cities uh, or 196 countries that are relatively successful have capital cities that are working. And I want to put it to you that it's almost impossible to imagine the future success of Jamaica without also contemplating the revitalization of Kingston as part of that process. Now, can we improve a failing capital city? And this is often a debate that goes on. Dublin, Belfast, Tirana, Seoul, Bogota, Nassau. These are all capital cities that have somehow improved 
what they're doing. And I just want to spend a moment talking to you about Dublin, partly because this is the, the city that my parents come from, and it's partly because I think Dublin's a really important and interesting case. Now, many of you will know uh, some elements of the history of Ireland, but I think the key thing to say is that up to the 1840s, Ireland grew a population of about 8 million people. And then a whole series of famines unfolded, and the population of Ireland went down to only just over 4 million people. So the country lost half its population over a period of about 60, 70 years. And when we get back to about 1960 from all of that, Ireland has a population of 4 million and Dublin has a population of about 1 million. And of course, for a long period of time, nothing changed here. But in the 1980s, Dublin uh, was part of a whole process of change with Ireland during, joining the European Union. The Irish diaspora in America becoming a very important source of new investment into the country. The focus on creative and cultural industries as a generator not just of jobs but also of identity. And the opening up of uh, the educational system in Ireland towards international students and everything else. And what happened basically from 1980 through to today is 40 years of incredible growth and success in Dublin. A post-agricultural economy has become a creative and innovation and a services economy. You can see some of the vibrancy here in this picture. But I think it's one of the few examples of where an, an island economy that lost half its population figured out how to use its diaspora and a whole series of other policies to reinvent its capital city, and it's been done extremely effectively. Now, I've already mentioned that the focus for cities in the future is about grasping these opportunities of innovation, experience, and habitat, moving away from this focus on simply the efficiency of consumption, commuters, and corporates. And what this means, I think, for our central business districts, what we sometimes call downtown or our central district, is that we're moving from being primarily focused on business to being much more focused on experience. And I've, I've already made this point once, but I want to stress it again, that it's about the quality of the urban environment that we produce. It's not about the number of businesses or jobs that we have there. Now, all of this presupposes that we can create some kind of effective city governance. How can we organize these transitions? So the leadership of the transition from a city center that's focused on one set of tasks to being focused on a slightly different set of tasks is very important. And as Pedro spelled out in his first lecture, the cost of chaos of failed governmental intervention is so great that a whole uh, uh, development cycle can be, lose, uh, can be lost in the consequence. And most cities are underpowered cities in one way or another. They don't have the legal frameworks, the fiscal and financial competence that they need for the opportunity of the century of city and the promise of good urbanization that I've been talking about. So we have to figure out a way to help them. So let's move to the second half of the lecture and ask the question, what is it that business can do to seize the opportunities of this century of the city that I've been describing and to become an effective partner in this transition process that I've been talking about, recognizing that governments don't have all the answers? If cities are underpowered in the way uh, I suggested in this article a few years ago, then we can't rely on the cities themselves to acquire the power. We have to help them. So if we're going to help them, why do we do that and how do we do that? And let's quickly get into this subject then. So you probably don't need me to say that the process of global urbanization that I've described in the century, the century of the city is also a process of business urbanization. Whether it's that cities have become emerging markets for businesses, or whether it's that businesses are moving back into downtowns and away from suburbs, or whether it's that capital is concentrating more on the fixed assets in a city, or whether it's the rise of tradable services in how to run a city or how to manage a city, or whether it's because cities are becoming the hubs of those new innovation economies I was talking about, all of these are aspects of how the urbanization process is not just about people moving to cities, it's about businesses becoming intertwined with cities and their future. 
And some simple examples is that, of course, we have the big growth of urban tourism that we didn't have before. Retail has re-urbanized in a funny way, the, the localization of retail in many parts of the world. Housing has become re-urbanized as people realize that actually urban lifestyles and urban dwelling, if it's safe and clean and livable, are attractive. And the knowledge economy and, of course, urban real estate are now you know, very big investment assets. So this leads to a question about whether cities are becoming more like businesses. And maybe if you want to think of it in a very particular way, you could say, well, actually, cities are becoming a bit more like businesses. They, they compete in contested markets. They're much more networked. They have to attract investment from outside. They get preoccupied with their balance sheet, their talent strategy, their marketing, their brand. Cities are becoming much more like businesses in a certain kind of way, which means they want to learn the lessons of business, how to do branding effectively, how to specialize, where to have their niche markets, how to retain their talent becomes big questions for them. But in other ways, cities are nothing like businesses, of course, because they don't get to choose which markets they operate in. Their profits are taken usually by a higher tier of activity. That They have to serve markets whether they're profitable or not. Um, their identity and their brands is somehow shaped and influenced by others beyond them. And uh, their primary purpose is not, as it were, simply to trade and make a profit, but it's to support a community. Now, for all of these reasons and these differences between them, we find that cities suffer from certain kinds of challenges and problems where businesses have something to offer. And therefore, uh, the key issue is how to get cities and business working together to improve the quality of life, accelerate urban revitalization, partner with higher tiers of government, position and promote the city as a destination for population, for investment, for enterprise and others, and increase the co-investment and the risk-taking between public and private sectors so that we can create some durable platforms to do that. Now, in my view, a quiet revolution is taking place in this kind of place leadership for cities, the mechanisms through which businesses become effective partners. And just five years ago, I did a, a short survey. So on the, on the vertical side of this axis, you see the names of 10 organizations that are what we would call business leadership teams within cities. And those organizations are trying to improve the quality of life in those cities. And across the top side of this uh, slide, you see kind of 10 activities that they do. In some cases, it's about promoting the city, engaging in the branding and the marketing. In other cases, it's about helping the city uh, to develop business know-how around enterprise solutions. In other ones, it's about attracting external investment into the city. But what you see very clearly is that these business leadership organizations have become key parts of what makes the city work. Now, when we looked at these organizations and we asked the questions, why have they formed and what do they do well, it seems very obvious in a way that what they've been good at is creating a long-term vision for the city, building a business culture around how certain projects are implemented, creating, as it were, a strong lobby on behalf of the business, coming from a broad base of sectors, not narrowly from one sector or another, behaving in an apolitical way, so not taking sides in political debates, not using public subsidies either, using enterprise skills and innovation, positioning, knowing how to prioritize what's important, and being evidence-based. So when we think about these kinds of organizations, we can begin to see that there's certain business platforms that now play a key role in how a number of our cities perform. So let me take you through how they do it, and we'll talk about some cities in particular. In each case, I'm going to give you an example of what a business organization has done in a city, where this idea originated from, but then how it's been used in a, a global south or a developing market context. So let's get cracking, uh, and, and here are the 10. I'm not going to read them out because we'll see each of them right now. 
But these business leadership teams, where a broad cross-sectoral group of businesses come together in a single platform to help the city think about its future. This was, in a sense, invented in New York by a man called David Rockefeller that some of you will have heard of, who created an organization called the New York City Partnership. It was then developed by a group of business people in London who created an organization called London First. But in Bogota, the capital city of Colombia, Pro Bogota has emerged in the last 10 years as a really interesting organization that is promoting much better metropolitan coordination, particularly trying to deal with the challenges between Bogota itself and Cundinamarca, the region around it, trying to get the, the mayor and the governor to work together. And in particular, as you can see in the bottom part of this slide, the 30 or so business leaders that have come together in the Pro Bogota project have have focused a huge amount on improving the quality of education in the city and working very strongly on land use planning and the efficient use of land to create a much better land use planning system. So congratulations to Pro Bogota. Now, some of these organizations have focused more attention on long-term planning and visioning of the city. And we've seen that happen in Shanghai and in Sydney but also particularly in Mumbai. So an organization that calls itself Mumbai First came together, 22 large businesses working together in a platform. And what they decided to do was to produce a vision for the future of Mumbai to try to bring together the Maharashtra state government with the 46 municipalities in the metropolitan area to cr create a business-led civic vision for the future of the city. Anyone who's been to Mumbai knows it's a very chaotic place. And Pedro's idea of the, the cost of chaos is alive and well in Mumbai. But two of the things that this vision led to, supported by the business leadership, was the creation of a transformation unit for Mumbai within the Maharashtra government. And it gave rise to the development of Mumbai's new metro system and to the Trans Harbour Link. Some of you have seen that, the bridge that goes out into the water that takes you uh, from the northern parts of Mumbai right into uh, the downtown, a new piece of infrastructure that wouldn't otherwise exist. So congratulations, I think, are due to Mumbai first. Now, Let's go to Johannesburg and talk about urban renewal. You see, in the 1980s, while the apartheid system was still in place and hadn't yet been rejected, a number of private sector businesses were very concerned about the future of the inner city of Johannesburg. There was widespread disinvestment, dereliction, the growth of high levels of crime, lots of buildings that were unoccupied. And about 20 businesses got together and formed something that they called the Johannesburg uh, uh, Inner City Business Coalition. And the, the founder of that is a man called Neil Fraser, who I'm lucky to know very well. But these businesses essentially said to each other, while all of this devastation and disinvestment is going on, firstly, our assets are reducing in their value. But secondly, we're losing the magic of our city. If our city center is not working, then nothing here is going to succeed. So they effectively campaigned for the new institutions after uh, the change of regime in South Africa to prioritize the city center. They created an inner city partnership grouping that brought together the city government with the business coalition. That led to the creation of an organization called the Johannesburg Development Agency, which then oversaw uh, a multiple number of redevelopment projects, including in Gandhi Square and, and many others. It led, of course, to Constitution Hill, the clustering together of the, the memorials with the, the governmental uh, processes. And eventually, this led to the creation of some organizations called SIDS, City Improvement Districts, based on the North American model of bids, but focusing very much on Johannesburg's downtown. Now, I don't need to tell you, because you can see this very easily on screen anywhere you look, that design and quality of place were right at the heart of what this business council promoted, and we were right at the heart of what the Inner City Partnership did and the Johannesburg Development Agency. By persisting in the imperative to redevelop the downtown and to make it habitable, workable, livable, and visitable again, uh, they ended up creating a place that was able to stage uh, the Soccer World Cup, of course, 
course, uh, given to them uh, by FIFA in 2010. Now, staying with this broad theme, I want to take you to Santiago in Chile, where the development of this idea of place management through collaborative vehicles between businesses and civic institutions, what's sometimes called BIAs, originally invented in Canada in downtown Toronto in 1958. There are now about 50,000 of these platforms around the world where businesses essentially agree to pay a small incremental levy in a defined geography where there's a concentration of commercial activity. It's a, it's a different proposition where you've got a mixture of uses, but where you've got primarily commercial activity, businesses agree to work together to improve the performance of the place through better management. It's not a way of, as it were, uh, uh, undoing what local government does, but it's a way of supplementing, usually with safety, sanitation, marketing, street furniture, activation and animation, events, festivals, open nights, other kinds of things, to give the city centre back its vitality, its sense of place, but also its sense of safety. And in Santiago, they identified 11 of these that have been piloting this approach, and they're just about to begin with their first two proper business improvement districts. And just ahead of them is the city of Cape Town. Cape Town has been doing this now for nearly 20 years. A similar process emerged in Cape Town where a group calling themselves the Cape Town Partnership, a group of about 20 businesses, said the city centre of Cape Town used to be a wonderful place. We've had the disinvestment. We've had uh, the high levels of crime. We've had the lack of safety. Let's produce a vision and a plan for this. And then a partnership with the city produced uh, the city improvement districts. They started with one but they now have 13, and they're not just in the city center, but they're in neighborhoods and townships where lots of people live as well. Now, one of the reasons that these places work, these platforms for place management work, is because they bring the ingenuity of business together with the partnership of local government to create places that firstly become more stable, and after becoming more stable, they become more attractive, more exciting, more interesting, more diverse. And they're managed in just the same way that you would manage a shopping mall or a hotel or an airport. The skills of place management are used for an urban district to try to create a more lively and appealing place. So city improvement districts in Cape Town. Let's move to public-private partnerships and talk a little bit about Accra in Ghana. Many of you will know that there's been a strong focus on public-private partnerships in cities like Hong Kong and Paris, and indeed uh, a massive railway project is now underway in Paris. Huge amounts of uh, real estate development have been done on a PPP basis, of course, in Hong Kong. But in Accra, what they did starting in October 2011 was essentially to build a public and private uh, partnership program. And one of the things that's been really important has been using the PPP model to really revitalize and improve and better manage their urban markets. The markets at the center of the city where they have large numbers of traders often working in an informal environment, high levels of unsafety, their products stolen, their money stolen, violence occurring in the market sometimes. But creating a new infrastructure for the markets and using more of a place management approach to manage the market has been a key feature of Accra's success. And in the case of Ahmedabad, the capital city of Gujarat in northern India, the PPP model has been used very effectively, particularly to do bus rapid transit, to create a new public transport system, high capacity, decongesting the roads by creating much more reliable high capacity bus systems, using a dedicated lane, creating more of a sense of place in the city by reducing the use of vehicles on them. I've already showed you this slide, uh, this slide, excuse me, I've already showed you this slide about clean, connected, and compact being the route to decarbonization of the cities. But I want to tell you about an organization called Creo Antofagasta. Antofagasta is a mining town in uh, sort of 
halfway up the coast of Chile in Latin America. And Antofagasta has been a very important uh, source as an industrial city of copper and tin and other kinds of things. But the, uh, the mining industry has gradually collapsed in the city. But 13 of the companies involved in mining got together to create a partnership to look at how they could recreate the vitality of the city. And one of the things that they've done very successfully is to invest in decarbonizing Antofagasta by investing in new renewable energy sources, new kinds of uh, energy efficiency mechanisms, creating new enterprises that support circular economy in waste and water and food and everything else. So if you like, business leadership on the sustainable development of Antofagasta. Many of you will have been to Nassau in the Bahamas. I'm lucky to have been there uh, many times on, on various projects. I think that what we have been able to see in Nassau is business leadership really playing a role in supporting small and medium-sized enterprise in just the way that in Los Angeles and Milan, they've been doing this for many years. But Nassau has been very effective in getting large businesses to work together with small businesses to sponsor particularly programs around business skills and innovation. And this is how, as it were, uh, people who live, as they call it in Nassau, over the hill, which basically means they live in the poorest neighborhoods, have been much more able to participate in the urban revitalization projects in Nassau by the large businesses really helping to build small businesses uh, in those neighborhoods. We've also seen a similar process to this in Addis Ababa, the capital of Ethiopia, where there's been a strong focus on women-led enterprises really being supported by big businesses and of course self-help initiatives in this regard where the Addis Ababa Chamber of Commerce has been a really key partner in placing attention on women's businesses bringing them out of the informal sector and creating opportunities for them to really grow so a business initiative to really grow enterprise there's just three more to go and then we'll be winding up Place-brand partnerships are a very important way in which private sector skills can be used to support place leadership and place effectiveness. And we've seen this very strongly in cities like Amsterdam and San Diego. But I want to focus a little bit of attention on Cancun in Mexico. Because Cancun in Mexico is a very interesting city, town in all sorts of reasons. For some people, they think of it just as a very long beach with a kind of tourism destination attached to it. In fact, that beach and that waterfront has been the subject of a very long-term partnership between public and private sector to try to improve the performance of the waterfront to make it the destination that it is. And the private sector has then been a really key player in the branding of Cancun, not just as a great visitor destination for a holiday, but as a place, of course, for conventions, for expos, and for so much more. And Cancun, as you will know, has won all sorts of awards for its safe travel protocols and its partnership. Cancun was almost the first city in the Americas to come out of the pandemic and to say, we're open for visitors again because of the strength of the public and private partnership there. Ninth example comes from Macau, where I want to talk about how business has really engaged in supporting the education process to align better the university curriculum and the school curriculum with the needs of future industries. And businesses have invested substantially with the universities in creating innovation and technology partnerships uh, around a, a new curriculum where there are guaranteed opportunities to work with certain firms as the curriculum is recalibrated towards the things that they do. Two more cities to go in this long list, but I want to talk just briefly about one of your neighbors. You see, it's almost impossible today to remember the Miami of 1980. Actually, hands up if you remember the Miami of 1980, right? How this city has transformed itself over that time, I think, is an in incredible story. And it's not just an incredible story about luck and opportunity and uh, Cuban migrants giving rise to a new kind of entrepreneurship and the capital of the Latin Americas idea. It's actually a story about business people working together to solve problems, and in particular, to solve the problems of crime, 
safety and violent crime in particular, with uh, the working up of uh, the one community, one goal aspiration that was led by uh, the Miami, the Greater Miami Chamber of Commerce. Jay Molina provided the leadership on this agenda to improve skills and safety, but also then a whole series of, uh, of new ways of communicating with each other about safety for visitors of the hospitality industry and using, as it were, safety as a kind of a uh, catalytic policy through which to try to transform the city and to create that safe place where things like the Wynyard Art Galleries and all of that can now thrive because the city is a safer place to be. And then finally, if you like, the superstar city in this regard is, of course, Medellin in Colombia where the transformation of this city, since, of course, the, uh, the end of, of the war, the end of the control of the drug cartels, has been very important. And this city has rightly won a huge range of awards. But it hasn't been just the peace deal, or the effective mayors, or the active citizens. It's also been the business partnerships through uh, two particular groups, Pro Antioquia, a bit like Pro Bogota, group of business leaders who are in favor of the region, but also the Grupo Empresarial Antioqueño, the, the, uh, the business group of Antioquia. They have worked together very decisively to campaign, particularly around the investment in transport infrastructure and to structure that as PPP. They've created much more discipline around the big projects that the city has done. They've also, of course, focused a lot of their efforts on diversifying the economy. So what have I been trying to say to you? I've been trying to say that these tools that have been invented in the cities that we all know and love, the, the New Yorks and the Parises and the Singapores, are also tools that have been adapted and customized to other parts of the world who have learned how to use them effectively for themselves. Now, when and why do these kinds of business leadership contributions to place leadership work? Well, I think there are seven secrets of success, as there nearly always are when you think about these things. Firstly, you've got willing leaders who are willing to act in a civic way, a common vision beyond narrow business interests. You might have a, a common risk or a challenge, the fear of a lost cycle, a shock to the system, competitor behavior from other locations, or reputational risks, so a common risk that they respond to. Uh, a team that plays to its strengths and not to its weaknesses. You know something's gone wrong when the city government's in charge of the marketing and the business community's in charge of the planning, and you need to kind of put it back the other way, right? So play to the things that you're good at. Uh, trust and generosity and credit sharing are very important. Most of these business leadership initiatives I've described are ones where the mayor or the governor or the prime minister was encouraged to take the credit for what they'd done because it was a partnership effort. It wasn't business seizing, as it were, the credit to themselves. Simplification is very important, turning complex things into something that's simple and doable. Discipline and sequencing, not trying to do everything at once, really important. Picking off the things you can do, helping one university develop a better course, helping the city centre become a better place to visit, helping, for example, one transport project to be on time and in budget. Do one thing well, and that creates momentum that others want to pursue. So I think that's very important to, to be clear about. Um, how, what does it look like? How does it work? This is a kind of notional, very simplified organizational system. Generally, these business initiatives that I've been describing are part of something where there's a leadership board, a, a mayor, a prime minister, a senior minister, one or two business leaders, maybe some institutional leaders. They form a small, tight leadership group four, five, six people at most, and they decide to commit themselves to each other to do something together. There's always a coordination group that builds that sense of trust and clarity and partnership. And then the choices are made about which activities need to be done in which kinds of ways. So, for example, whether we're going to start off with long-term visioning or whether we're going to do urban renewal or whether we're going to do a promotion and brand building. But not everything is done at once. Now, 
when this works, we get a certain kind of place leadership dividend that comes from all of this. And I think that dividend includes that we're able to have um, a, a coordinated approach which avoids this idea of zero sum. If one place succeeds, another place fails. We try to be much more sequential. We're able to get much more coherent and aligned actions between different parts of government. We have a credible strategy that people believe in because it's evidence-based. Obviously, it attracts more kinds of investment into the bankable opportunities that it creates. But even more importantly, any of the initiatives I've described to you, I think leave a legacy of enhanced capacity and capability to do more. So the art of sequencing is to do things that work in such a way that they create capacity to do more later. So I'm coming to the end now. What did I say to you just now over the last hour? Well, I think I said this. I think I said that urbanization means that cities host more and diverse activities and many more economic sectors than in the past. I think I said to you that nations compete and thrive increasingly through their cities, that national development requires urban revitalization, especially in capital cities and their centers. I said that the pandemic has shifted our focus uh, on cities towards quality as well as efficiency, but not efficiency instead of quality. That economy and sector policies, so macroeconomic policies and sector policies, must be complemented by place leadership and place coordination. And I think I said that place leadership is a joint endeavor between governments and citizens and civic bodies and businesses. And I hope I also said that a decade of such leadership is now an imperative in Kingston if Jamaica is going to succeed in the way you want it to. Now, what did I not say? I didn't say that government isn't working and businesses should take over, right? I didn't say that business can solve all urban development problems. I didn't say we should privatize public space. I didn't say downtown belongs to business. I didn't say only business knows what to do. And I didn't say that businesses can't help inner city residents in the poorest areas. Indeed, they can, and they do in many parts of the world. And I didn't say, I absolutely didn't say, the pandemic means that we should give up on our downtowns. In fact, I think the pandemic means that our downtowns have just become the most precious spaces that we have. So in closing this lecture and thinking about the Honorable Morris Facey and his life as a business leader, as a family man, as a civic leader, an inspired civic leader. So who is he with in this picture that I showed you earlier? Well, firstly, he's with David Rockefeller the man who founded the New York City Partnership, the organization that rescued the city of New York in the 1970s when it was going bankrupt and created the new financial structure for the city. David Rockefeller is next to Narinda Nayar, the chairman of Mumbai First, the organization that created the new metropolitan vision for Mumbai that gave them the opportunity to build those infrastructure projects. Narinda is next to Bulelwa, Makalima, Nganwa, who was for a long time the chief executive of the Cape Town Partnership. She was the person who brought forward the city improvement districts and made them work alongside my very good friend, Andrew Burain, who works there. Underneath them, you have Vincent Lowe, the chairman of Shu on Land, probably the most important property company in Hong Kong and in Shanghai, who has led the urban revitalization process in those cities, but also in Nanjing and Wuhan and many others. They are next to Michael Bloomberg, the man who you recognize, perhaps the person who exemplifies the business of cities more than anyone, the ability to bring business skills to the service of city leadership, but also within the Bloomberg Foundation to create all of this work that they've done to support cities. And Michael Bloomberg is next to Maria Carolina Castillo, who's the chief executive of Pro Bogota. The organization that I explained has uh, led the fight, as it were, to create a new partnership between the city and the region in which it sits in the capital of Bogota. So like Maurice Facey, I think each of these people in their own way 
um, loved their city, loved their nation, um, made a commitment as part of their professional lives, not just to be business people, but also to be leaders of their cities and leaders uh, amongst their friends. But more than anything else, to see place leadership as a kind of civic duty, which is a 21st century imperative. So thank you very much for listening to me. I'm very grateful to have had the chance to speak to you. And I know that Joe is now going to moderate some Q&A. And I'm sorry I was a little bit over time, Joe. All right. Thank you again. Thank you again, Greg. Um, please join me again in another round of applause for Greg. Um, now, as I said before, I really want this to be a conversation, so I'm going to take a look at your questions. Um, we, I think we're going to try our very best to end at 6.15. Um, the last time we did this, I had some very angry people telling me that I did not ask their questions. Um, I'm going to do my very best to ask as many as I can. Um, what we will do is the questions that we do not address here. Um, we will ask Greg offline and publish his answers on the um, CB Faces Instagram account. Surprise. <laughs> so um, I hope you, if, and the information for Slido is, is back up. Um, so I hope you had a chance to, one, enter your questions and two, to vote. Um, the first question, because I am moderator, I get to ask my own question first. What would be the first thing that you would suggest that we change in Kingston? It's difficult to say the first thing because, of course, I don't know what's already in place. But I think the things that there need to, there does need to be a shared vision about the future of the city. And in the conversations that I've had with people, I haven't heard any differences of opinion. Although I have noticed a habit of people being contrary in how they sometimes behave in the discussions. But I don't notice anything in what different people have said about the future of the city that is inconsistent. So I think that should be crystallized into something that's simple and clear and visionary and compelling for everyone. I think that would be very helpful. And then I think you need to pick one project and do it brilliantly. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I'm lucky enough to be staying at the Rock Hotel, and of course my host is Stephen. So I look at that hotel and I think that's one project done brilliantly. And um, I think if you continue as groups and together to do simple things really well, there will be a big improvement. Of course, a lot of my conversation in the last two days has been about the downtown and about the waterfront. So a proper plan for the downtown, maybe a city improvement district for the downtown, maybe a proper revitalization effort uh, around the waterfront to create something that's for everyone. You know, there's talk of a, a coastal park that is for everyone. I think these are brilliant ideas, and I would rather you focused on doing one, two, three things well than thinking you've got to do 30 things at once because 30 things at once isn't going to work. So I, I would say at, one of the great things of, and I've talked a lot about the great things about working at Panjam, but what are the, one of the great things is that over the last two days I've spent a, a bit of time with Greg. And you've, you've spoken quite a bit about low-hanging fruit in our yeah. conversations. What would you say are some of the low-hanging fruit for us to pick? Well, um, one piece of low-hanging fruit is your soft power. So if you think about the, the DNA of Kingston, the DNA of Jamaica, and you, you know who your national heroes are, you know what the cultural resonance is of, of Kingston and Jamaica around the world. Um, I don't see that huge asset being properly deployed on your behalf yet. It's mm -hmm. almost like you've got this global soft power slightly accidentally. So uh, I think you should become intentional around the story, the brand, the proposition, the, you know, the incredible, incredible 
creative dynamism of the place. So that would be one thing I would do. Um, I think the, the other thing that would be low-hanging fruit is obviously now to pursue the waterfront story because of the, um, you know, the, the aspirational investment that's been made, uh, not just at The Rock, but in some of the other buildings around and about. You should really do that. Mm -hmm. I think that would be low-hanging fruit uh, to really get at. And, and I'm intrigued by um, the idea that some of the senior people in government are discussing which is about you know whether to reconsolidate the government buildings and the parliament and the ministries in a certain location. That's actually a much longer term project, I would say. But you know the waterfront is already happening, the brand already exists. So why not really focus on managing those two? Mm -hmm. And managing the waterfront better will bleed into getting a comprehensive approach to the inner city overall which i think is is key or the you know the uh, the downtown area there's many many other things but i do think that's where you've already got momentum and you just need to augment it complete it you know in in any city joe i'm, I'm sure everybody in the room knows this every city in a certain way has a crisis of confidence Right? And the Medellin story or the Miami story is so important in that regard. Because when bad things have been happening or reputation has been less than it should be or when you know, people have been dissing you, as it were, from outside, it does reduce confidence. So confidence building activities and deliberately doing confidence building activities I think is really important. So that's why Waterfront, Downtown, Brand probably are the ones I would go for. So part of the other conversations that we've been having with Greg have been, and I, I would say your response has always been, this is not unique to Jamaica, it's everywhere, Yeah. right? And so I'll ask you, do you see any unique challenges that we have in Jamaica? I haven't seen anything here that I think is totally unique, no. But what I have seen is that the, there's a dramatic gap between the potential of the place, which is exponential, mm -hmm. and what's been achieved in the last sort of 10 to 20 years, where I think that, and I don't know what the reasons are, and I'm not pointing fingers at, at anyone or anything, because I don't know. But I think that, you know, the reason I spent a lot of time talking about this century of the city is because for about 40 years other cities have been getting on board with this idea of reurbanization um, the opportunity of the city creating a a, a, a a new kind of space and of course you've had one or two very distinguished people in the city doing that but i don't get the sense that there's been a very strong coalition there so what's unique if you want to put it that way is that the scale of the opportunity is so great but somehow you seem to have had two or three cycles of initiative taking which haven't succeeded. And I don't know why that is. I'd like to know why that is because, you know, that needs fixing, right? Mm -hmm. But um, it seems to me that's the honest thing I can say, that the potential is enormous, but the momentum has been stilted, and I don't know why. I think that would be an interesting set of discussions. There are a number of people in this room who I think would give you very unique and tailored answers and opinions to that question. Can I say one more thing? Absolutely. I'm going to say one more thing. I think that there may be, mm -hmm. and uh, again, I'm not making a criticism of anyone, there may be a tendency to look at what's gone wrong in the past and to, as it were, engage in a, a kind of an orgy of lamentation, right? And uh, actually what you need to do is just look forward. Yes. Yeah. All yes. you need to do is say, okay, the past is the past. Something didn't work because, you know, it didn't work. Yes. But now is the time it can work. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And I mean, it's an obvious thing to say, but um, you, we need to have a forward looking perspective. This time is different, and it's different for all sorts of reasons. Let's do it now. Let's get on with the cycle now. That seems dear Absolutely. to me. Absolutely. Okay. Um, I'm going to take the top question. I encourage you as to keep voting on the questions um, as well. Um, if we are already caught in a cycle of bad urbanization, we have a socially stratified city, how do we change that? Yeah, I mean, this is, 
the biggest question, right, that you face. Because the risk is that you go for a cycle of good urbanization, and the consequence is that you do it in pockets or in patches, and there's a perception that some people benefit more than others, right? And this is why, actually, I'm a big skeptic about this 15-minute city idea, because 15-minute city works fine if you're already in a city that's got a fantastic transport system and brilliant schools and hospitals everywhere, but otherwise it's just a recipe for segregation. So we don't really want that. So I, I think that what we have to notice is that... Um, People who are living in the poorest homes and are living in the poorest neighborhoods with the least services and the least access to opportunities are the most likely to become disenfranchised by a process, right? Mm -hmm. And so what we have to do very deliberately, I think, is build a process that includes them and addresses their needs. So I always say to people, homes and jobs and opportunities for children, very important. And in particular, the health dimension of that has become really key. If you look at the life expectancy differences of people living in different parts of the city, it becomes very obvious. So how do you do that when the subject of this conversation is not complete reform of the health care or the education system? It's about urban revitalization. Well, I think you do have to build some platforms for creating much better housing for people. And uh, there are many examples around the world. We didn't talk about them in today's lecture, but there are many examples around the world of community-led, faith group-led, self-help style of community housing that enables us to produce better housing for people. Lots of examples around the world of how you stabilize neighborhoods where poorer people are living and you create better services and infrastructures for them. And then I think what we heard about in the discussions about um, Medellin and the examples I was giving you from, from, uh, from Cancun and elsewhere, lots of opportunities to use um, enterprise development, to use supply chains, to use obviously direct employment. There are lots of mechanisms where as the city rises, people who live in the poorest community can be taken with you. And I, I usually say, and I, I say this often when I'm working in Africa, that you know there are three kinds of tools. There are tools that promote growth, there are tools that promote development, and there are tools that promote inclusion. And you need to use all three, and you need to not expect the tools that promote growth will automatically create the inclusion. You've got to have specific tools to do that. It's a very obvious and simple way of putting it. But I think it, it, it sometimes there's a kind of a political philosophy that says, if you get growth, everything else will work out. Mm -hmm. Or if you just do inclusion, everything works. Actually, you need growth, you need development, and you need inclusion. There are different tools for each. Okay. Fantastic, thank you. Um, there has been a major emphasis on build it and they will come, but how do you balance city profitability with city livability without displacing the people who live in cities? Right, so there's two parts to that question, I think. So uh, I don't believe in build it and they will come. That's never been my view. I think you have to make a place really attractive that's more than building it that's about place design that's about invitation that's about activation and animation a lot of what i've been saying to people this week is that place management is actually about creating a sense of place not just creating a facility mm -hmm. and you know many people in the room know this but it's a it's a point that's well worth making so i don't think it's about building it and they will come i think it's activate it and they will come right if you want to use it very simply and uh, so the second half of the question was is there a risk that that creates exclusion so we have to build shared spaces in our cities i mean one of the lessons from the work i've done in lebanon in belfast and in other post crisis cities is that public space is very important because you have to create spaces where the whole community can enjoy something and any of you who've been to havana in cuba or those of you who've been uh, any time recently to Tel Aviv in Israel or to Barcelona will know that the waterfront space in those cities is the central park as it were and that's the place where once you've got your shorts on nobody knows unless they look carefully at the brand of your shorts uh, what your income group is right so there's something about public space and particularly beaches and waterfronts as a great equalizer so I'm not saying this is a total solution to socioeconomic inequality, right? So whoever asked the question, please know I didn't say that. But what I, what I would say is that the more shared space you can create, the more of a sense of 
common ownership of the city people will have. You see, the city belongs to everyone, so let's design it and make it in such a way that everyone gets to enjoy it. Mm -hmm. I think I think you've addressed this, but I'm going to ask this question anyways, just in case you wanted to add anything. What are some of the ways that the city can shift away from more archaic ideas of placemaking and shift towards more progressive placemaking and good urbanism? Yeah, okay, it's a very good question. And I mean, the, the point I would make is that the old ideas about placemaking were essentially that if the design was good, it would work. And what I hope I said sufficiently in the lecture is that actually we need our cities to be different things on different times of the day, different days of the week, different weeks of the year, different seasons of the year. So we need our places to be very agile, which is why I'm focusing much more on this idea of activation and animation and active management rather than just place design. Mm -hmm. You know, good design is very, very important. So architecture students, I didn't say good design is not important. But good design on its own is not sufficient, I think, will be the, uh, the point I would make. I think that we've got to have this much more activist approach to how we remake place every day in different ways. See, um, if cities are going to focus on habitat innovation and experience, part of that is about surprise. So you have to be able to surprise people in the way that you manage public space and in the opportunities you invite them for. There has to be something different happening every night of the week, not something the same happening every night of the week. And I think that part of the challenge about getting rid of this idea that the city centre may not be safe is to activate it more actively, invite more people to come in. It's the presence of people on the street that makes the city safe. Right? Our next question is, how important is a well-managed transport system to the development of any thriving city and nation on a whole? How important? It's very, 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 very important. Um, I mean, one of the things that did surprise me when um, Stephen very kindly took me on a tour of the the city centre yesterday was just, you know, these three-lane highways going up and down. Well, you know, I think everybody knows now that three-lane highways reduce the quality of place. You can't dwell, you can't stop, you can, there's no, you know, you get what we call road kill rather than street life, right? So, um, so I think that there is going to need to be a transition which I've seen happen in the South African cities because I've been part of that with the introduction of bus rapid transit, the creation of light rail and things. There will have to be a transition ultimately away from lots and lots of small vehicles with internal combustion engines charging up and down those streets, not just because that's an inefficient transport system. It's not the best way for people to go about their lives, get to work, etc., but it also militates against the quality of the place that you want to have because essentially as soon as you walk out of the door of any building, you're confronting a motorway, mm -hmm. although it might be a motorway that looks like a traffic jam. So I, I think that, that this is a big challenge and um, if I did have the chance to talk to the government, I think Pedro said this in the first lecture, that some kind of metropolitan transport system of mixed modes, obviously you've got to go for what's affordable, so bus rapid transit, better buses in general will be important. Obviously I, I saw the, the bus garage yesterday that I understand you know, is hardly being used and that kind of thing. So um, there are lots of issues here to be sorted out, but a proper transport system is the critical key for any city, both to realize its social ambitions, its economic ambitions, the quality of its experience, but also its carbon agenda, right? If you're gonna, if you're gonna decarbonize the city, you're gonna have to move people out of cars. Absolutely. I, I, as people are so warmly reacting, I should say one more thing, Joe, that the, 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 the thing, the thing that I see in almost every city I visit around the world is that there is now an active plan in almost every city to reduce car usage, mm -hmm. right? Almost every city now. This is, not, this is not new magic. This is established orthodoxy. Okay. Um, our next question is, where does the line city in Saudi Arabia fall on the spectrum? Is it potentially the best example of a blended city? 
That's a very good question, isn't it? So, um, so just so ju there may be some people in the audience, who including know. me, who okay. don't know. Okay, so the Saudi Arabian government is involved in many exciting projects at the moment. So one of them is about doubling the size of Riyadh from a city of 7 million people to a city of 15 million people. Another one is the, uh, the redevelopment of Jeddah, the, the ancient port city of Saudi, to create a really vibrant kind of uh, new, new Jeddah, as it were. But then there are two other projects. One is called Naom, and the other is called The Line. So The Line is essentially a linear city going all the way from where uh, Jed, uh, for, from where Naom will be built, which is a completely new city, to the coast. And the idea is, instead of having a city that is clustered together in one place, it's just a, a linear city. Um, digitization is a key part of what they're trying to do. They're using it to develop 21st and 22nd century technologies. It's an innovation zone for urban tech, as we like to call it. And they think that this is not just a way of accommodating a whole set of activities in Saudi, but it's also a laboratory for the world in future urbanism. Um, I am personally doubtful about whether this project will realize these goals. And I think I'm doubtful partly because um, I'm more interested in how we retrofit and reinvent existing cities than how we build new cities, even though I can see it's an entirely a credible proposition that you should build new cities, particularly where you need them. But I also don't believe that um, the, the financial discipline that's required and the project discipline that's required to make this a big success is yet in place. So I'm doubtful about whether it will actually deliver on its vision. So just a, just a follow-up for that. So do you believe that, the, but there is potential for blended cities, just not... Oh, sure, this, sorry. Just, just so the blended city part, I mean, um, this is an idea I came up with a couple of years ago. People said, you know, the, the end of the pandemic, cities are dead. I said, no, cities are not dead, they're now blended. And what I think I mean by that is that increasingly, you'll have people who use the city by living in it or going to it every day or two days a week or three days a week. And other times, they'll be participating in what happens in the city using digital platforms. Now, if you take that to its logical extreme, it would be possible to own and operate a business in Kingston but to live somewhere else, in another country, not just in another part of Jamaica, right? Because digitization allows you to do that. So it gives rise to all of us, I think, um, if we're involved in activities where digitization is possible, uh, of us being able to be partially in one city and partially in another city. Now, you see a version of this coming with some of the cities in the Middle East and some of the cities in the ASEAN region, where they will provide people with a kind of digital visa. So you're allowed to own a business, you're allowed to own land, but you don't have to live there. It's the city by subscription. The city is a platform. So I, I think that in the longer term, Joe, this is not a current, this is not a kind of current opportunity for Kingston, I would suggest to you. But in the longer term, mm -hmm. you will have a version of what we've got used to as the kind of non-DOM expats. And you, you see them, of course, in the Bahamas and, and elsewhere. Yeah, So people who live in one place, but actually their assets are somewhere else and they operate a business somewhere else. We will have versions of that for ordinary people not just for the super rich, because you will, you will have through digitization a choice. And that will create cities that are more blended because of lives that are more hybrid. Okay, understood. Thank you very much. It is now 6.15. I know we're, ha we're having a great time, Michael, and I would love to keep going, but I promise that I would end at 6.15. There are still, I believe, I think eight questions, and as I promised... Um, do you want to try and do quick ones? So like 10 second answers so that we, I, I mean, I, I will try to do short answers if you do the short questions. Um, and, Anna, this is not my fault. This is, this is, this is Greg's. Don't want to leave people okay. dissatisfied. Just, okay. What effect do you think ESG will have on urban revitalization? 10 seconds, go. Uh, it will make us focus more on the decarbonization of the place, and it will make us focus more on the inclusion of the people who live in the poorer areas. Okay, perfect. If a city is dying while near cities are rising, where do you focus? Well, 
Uh, my view is that we should never allow any city to die. Perfect. You guys have to stop submitting questions. This is, it's not a game. <laughs> Please. <laughs> In what way is the decentralization of city infrastructure through development of remote networks and the creation of smarter cities considered in this new era? It's an embedded part of the whole platform, but be careful with decentralization because if you remember my point about the magic of cities, you need the centralization as well. Okay, great. Is there evidence that countries with more autonomous local governments have a higher probability of achieving good urban development outcomes? In general, yes, but in specific cases, more autonomous local governments are more likely to go bust. It's like, it's like school challenge quiz, this is great. <laughs> what are your thoughts on how we can use mixed use developments as a strategy and the role it plays in the urbanization of the city? All developments need to be mixed use. Would Nassau not be an example of that that would be closer for Kingston to follow? Which one? Nassau. Nassau. Um, Nassau has a slightly different set of problems, but it is, I think, a, a city that could have a partnership with Kingston. I, I agree. I think that there are things to learn both ways. These guys are still submitting questions. <laughs> I'm, ta I'm taking two more. Um, The size of our natural harbor has been a key value proposition for the development of a logistics hub economy. How can this coincide with urban renewal? It uh, can co coincide perfectly with it. It's exactly the sort of thing that um, Kingston needs to prioritize as part of a diversified economy. And I'm optimistic about pan-Caribbean trade being a key driver of that. Okay. How do we effectively use PPPs in a city such as Kingston, where informality and spontaneity are defining both positive and negative characteristics of its experience? I don't see any contradiction between informality and spontaneity in using PPPs, but you do need to figure out business models that will be sustainable. So I would suggest some small experiments. Okay, I think that's it. Okay. That was fantastic, thank you. Okay, don't worry. Greg is going, first of all, I see people packing up. Just hold on a second, okay? Y'all think you know where the refreshments are, you don't, okay? So just hold on for a second, all right? As I was saying, <laughs> Greg will join us for refreshments. So you can ask him if there were some questions that were submitted here that I did not get to in our lightning round. Um, you can ask him them outside, and he may take 10 seconds or two minutes to answer you, depending on how you, you throw it at him. Um, but before we break, um, I want to thank some people. Um, an event like this, which is a second staging, um, does not come together easily. It takes, I got to tell you, a, lo a lot of work, none of which was done by me. So first and foremost, I really want to thank Greg, Professor Clark for sharing his insights. This was a phenomenal presentation um, and in, an incredible Q&A, so thank you very much. We're very grateful that you joined us. Right. Um, next, I'd like to thank Anna Ward. I don't see her. She usually disappears at this time because she knows I'm gonna say her name. Um, her hard work transformed a vision um, that Stephen had. Oh, she's in the back. You'll see her, she's in a, oh, she's in a blue dress standing in the back. Um, her hard work has transformed a vision that Stephen had um, when I joined Panjam into the event that you saw in 2019 and the event that you're sitting at today. So, Anna, thank you very much. Um, all of the volunteers, um, one of the other best parts of working at Panjam are the people who work at Panjam. And the people who you saw who checked you in um, wearing black t-shirts um, work at Panjam. And I'd like to thank them. They worked at, as volunteers today. So thank you all very much. Um, next, I'd like to thank the Urban Development Corporation. 
and in particular the fantastic team at the Jamaica Conference Center who hosted us. As you can tell, we must be the only live room in the building that is under reconstruction. So thank you very much to, to the UDC and the JCC. Um, next on the screen is the Kingston Restoration Company. Um, after them is the University of Technology's Caribbean School of Architecture. I'd like to tell the students in the back that when we got here, Professor Clark said that he was going to count the number of students who were attended because you all said you were going to be here. So congratulations for those who decided to attend. Um, I'd also like to thank the Jamaica Institute of Architects, the Jamaica Chamber of Commerce, and the Rock Hotel. Um, and finally, last but not least, I'd really like to acknowledge you, the audience. Um, thank you for joining us today. I challenge you to continue this conversation, the conversations that you will have amongst yourselves, the conversations that you will have outside with Greg um, as well, um, and that you will work with us or without us to achieving the goals that we have discussed here today. Um, it would be remiss of me to close without acknowledging Mars Facey, a visionary and a patriot, and a man who took action to obtain long-term benefits for all. May we all aspire to do the same. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you.